Well, welcome to our master class on addiction and recovery. Did you know that we're living in a addiction epidemic right now? You know, since recording marijuana use in the United States in the last 40 years, marijuana use is at an all time high. Did you know that COVID significantly increased alcohol consumption, alcohol abuse, and alcohol dependency? Do you also know that in 2021, overdose deaths were the highest ever in recorded history in the United States? There were over 100,000 drug overdoses in the United States, 100,361 to be exact. Look, you owe it to yourself to understand what is addiction, what is the process of recovery. If you're suffering with an addiction today, we're going to help you understand the process of recovery. If you have a loved one who is suffering with an addiction, we're going to help give you hope. We're going to help you understand this process. And we want you to stay to the end because we're going to give you a very important resource that is going to give you a roadmap to become free from any addiction. I'm Dean Sinceri. This is my lovely wife, Holly Kim. Hi. And we've had a lot of experience huh, in, in dealing with addiction. Yes. Yes. I've been in recovery for 39 years, January 10th of 83. And I've been working in addiction since 1986. Yeah. Yeah. So we both have, and uh, for over three decades, we've been treating addiction, we've been helping families, we've been helping individuals. So let's get right into our topic. What is addiction? Well, a simple definition of addiction is that it's a compulsive, self-destructive behavior that causes many negative consequences. Yeah. It's a pretty general definition, but it's not just the behavior, but it causes what? Negative consequences. Yeah. And there's two types of addictions. There's substance addictions. There's addictions of ingesting some type of substance and you get attached to that. And there's also what we call behavioral addictions. Mm -hmm. So what are some substance addictions? There's alcohol, alcoholism, there's marijuana addiction, there's cocaine addiction, meth, crystal meth, opiate, oxycotton, heroin. There's also Xanax and- uh, Barbiturates. Barbiturates. There's all types of uh, drugs. And then there's the behavioral addictions like pornography, gambling, gambling, sex, spending, work. Probably the newest one in the next generation is uh, video games. Definitely. And none of these behaviors are really, well, some are more, but most of them are not bad in, in and of themselves. Obviously, video games are not bad in and of itself. The question is, is it creating negative consequences in your life? Right. Is it affecting your grades? Is it affecting your social time? Is it affecting your relationship with your family in a negative way? Is it affecting you to not do the things that you need to be doing on a daily basis? That's when it gets into negative consequences, and that's when it moves into the whole realm of what? Of addiction. Yeah. So we're going to give you a master class in understanding what is addiction and also what is the recovery process. So addiction affects the whole person, right? Everything. When you approach addiction, why it's difficult when they say, uh, oftentimes we were taught growing up that like alcoholism is a disease, right? Right. And what makes that complicated to understand is that it's not just a physical manifestation, that it affects the entire human being, Mm -hmm. the whole person. So it affects you physically, but also psychologically and also emotionally And also what? Spiritually. Yes. Right? So when we say that addiction is a disease, we're talking about a multifaceted, multidimensional illness that impacts us on so many different ways. Right. And so when you say physical, the primary organ that addiction affects is it affects the brain. It's a brain disease. Mm -hmm. It's a disease that that affects our neural pathways and creates... Uh, artificial ways for dopamine to be released on the, on the neural pathways. And our body gets used to that artificial means and our body stops doing it or slows down and doing it on our own so that when a person quits, they're no get longer getting those dopamine hits or 
Uh, dopamine does what? It helps increase pleasure, the feeling of pleasure, and also uh, decreases pain. So it affects our brain. Depending on what the drug is, it can affect other organs of the body, right? Alcohol affects what? The liver. The liver and perhaps other, dr- uh, other organs of the body, huh? Yeah, your stomach, your intestines. And cocaine. <laughs> your brain. <laughs> your brain. <laughs> yes. And, I mean, any toxin that's going in your body is going to be affecting your internal system. So your digestive system, your liver, your kidneys. I mean, it starts to affect that. Your heart, especially a lot of people that overdose have a heart attack, you know, because they burst their heart open because the cocaine is so strong. Yeah. You know, your body cannot handle that much toxins. So you can poison yourself. Yeah, so it affects you physically. Yes. When you say psychologically, it affects the way you think. Definitely. If you're struggling with an addiction or you have someone, a loved one, you'll notice over time as the addiction progresses, the thinking becomes more distorted. Very distorted. That they begin to minimize the use, rationalize, justify. Sometimes we use words like denial. Right. But the mind starts to distort. I was talking to a guy the other day who was struggling with an opiate addiction. And he said that in his own mind, he couldn't believe that there was some awareness that he was periodically taking fentanyl pills that were stamped as opiates. And that his mind was telling him it was okay because he knew the source that it was coming from. Mm -hmm. He's playing basically Russian roulette every time he took a pill. Right. But now that he's clean and clear-headed, he said, I can't believe my mind was thinking that. Right. You know, it it starts to develop rationalizations that start to become distorted. You know, I worked a hard week of work. I accomplished a lot. I deserve this, right? I deserve to go do this. I deserve to go gamble this much money. I deserve to... And it's like our mind starts to fool ourselves and others, and it starts to become really distorted. So it not only uh, affects you physically, it affects you when an addiction gets a hold psychologically. And the third area is that it impacts you emotionally. Tell them, tell us more about that. How does addiction impact you emotionally? Well, one of the things emotionally that happens is that when you have a feeling, let's say something, you've lost something, a person died or a relationship broke up, that you, you go to sedate that feeling. Unfortunately, what happens is the feeling doesn't go away. It just gets stuck deeper inside. So then the next time you have a loss, you sedate that one. So then that that emotion, that deep pain gets pushed down further. So after you do that for a long time, there comes a day when you have to completely start sedating to keep those emotions down because they're rumbling and any little thing is like a prick like you know like you stump your toe it becomes like the whole toe starts to gush with blood so all of a sudden now I need to use more to keep that pain down so now I'm having to just be sedated not because I'm psychologically got that gig going on or that I'm physically addicted, but now I'm emotionally needing to sedate to keep that push down. And I don't even understand it. I just know that I need to use to feel normal because I'm in constant pain now. Where before, in the beginning, I was doing it just to sedate that particular issue. But now everything's an issue. Everything aggravates me. Everything's painful. There's there's loom and gloom everywhere I look. So... I'm just, I'm waking up to figure out in my mind when is the next time that I can get high Mm. and I can sedate, have a drink or whatever. And I'm just dealing with that on, um, you know, a minute by minute, an hour by hour moment. So I can sedate this pain that I, that is bubbling. Yeah. So it affects us emotionally. Yes. Impacts us. And then the fourth area is that addiction affects us spiritually. Yeah. You know, our spirit is the deepest part of ourselves. And we are, we're often, because we're so scientific, we're in denial or have a lack of understanding of the realm of the spirit. But spiritually, addiction becomes like a level of possession, a mild possession, where a person is compelled to act out in a way that causes destruction in their lives. You know, when Jesus talked about the spiritual life, he said that 
uh, the thief talking about the evil spirit comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And my spirit, I come to give life and life abundantly. When you break down the impact of addiction on a person, you see stealing, killing, and destroying happen on all levels. In a sense, it's influenced by a spirit. And that those that have found recovery and have come out of addiction, one of the common elements that many of them have in common is that they say that they found a spirit that got rid of the evil spirit that started to give them life. Yeah. Even in bars, you go to bars and they refer to alcohol as spirits. Yeah. There's some level of understanding of the spiritual aspect. So when we look at how addiction affects us, it affects us so multifaceted, physically, psychologically, emotionally, and spiritually. And we'll get to this in the recovery process. If you're going to fully recover, you have to address all four areas. Yes. Because if you only address one or two, you're not going to get a full recovery and relapse is going to go up what? Significantly. Yeah. Well, and, and you using there we go. We you you using the word recovery. You know, one of the things is a lot of people say, "Well, I'm in recovery." You know, I'm going for recovery. What are you trying to recover? A lot of people don't even realize what they're saying. You're trying to recover your true self that you've lost through all of this, physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. And spiritually, you're trying to recover all of that from which you were sedated from. Yeah. So, what is recovery? Recovery is a return to normal health, yeah. mind, or strength. Another definition of recovery is it is the act or process of regaining possession of something that was lost or stolen. Right, and the, and the thing that you lose the most is yourself, is your values, your morals. When I talk about values, it's like what is important to you? I know for myself, honesty was important to me. Well, I wasn't honest when I was using. You know, I valued human beings, other people. I could care less if I saw them or I didn't. I valued uh, loyalty. You know, I wasn't loyal. I wasn't loyal to myself, much less anybody else. I valued my relationship with God. You know, I was only in a begging situation at that point. It wasn't It wasn't really a relationship where I had a personal relationship with God. It was personal, but it was all about me. It was all about help me, help me, help me, get me out of this, you know? Yeah, so when you break down what are some of the losses on those four different levels we talked about, well, you lose a sound mind. Definitely. You begin to lose your physical health. You start to lose your spiritual connection with God. You begin to lose uh, relationships. There's broken relationships. Finances. A lot of finance. You lose your ability to manage emotions or you lose your emotional health. Yeah. And so when you look at recovery, what we're saying is that recovery is intervening on the whole person and beginning to restore us or recovering all of those things that were lost. Yeah. So as Holly Kim said, and we'll tie this in with the resource that we're going to share with you later, you're really recovering your true self of who you really are, who you were meant to be. You're recovering your purpose. You're recovering the essence of who you were created to be. Yeah. And people often say, Right? I feel like I what? Uh, I lost myself. I lost myself. And what are they saying? That they lost their true self. And the truth is, is that it's not loss. It's just very deeply smothered. Yeah. All the pains on top of it, all of the things that your memories of unhealthy things is on top of what your truth is. So it's not lost. It feels lost. But you, it, as you un start to uncover, it starts to emerge. Yeah. The more you uncover that, the more it emerges. So if you don't do the work, then it stays hidden. Yeah. Your truth stays hidden. Yeah, yeah. And you're not free. I don't know about you guys, but I do not like to be controlled. And once I understood that I was being controlled by my addiction, that was the end of that. I was going to do whatever I had to do to get free. Yeah, and you yeah. did. And I did, yes. But I still work on myself, so don't think that I don't. I still have to work on myself. I'm far from perfect. However, I do work on myself. Yeah. So recovery has to do with recovering yourself physically, yes. recovering a sound mind psychologically. Yes. It's recovering emotionally, learning a new ability to manage emotionally, and recovering spiritually 
getting connected in a spiritual vision that works for you. When we look at the treatment model, there's three keys to successful treatment, and it can be done in a variety of ways. Number one is education. Mm -hmm. You have to understand what addiction is. We're just giving you a, a, a master class. We're just introducing you to what addiction is. But you have to get education. You have to understand what are the dynamics of addiction, how it affects all those different levels, and how it's impacting you. Secondly, you need to do the application process. Yeah. You can't just understand. You can't just understand. You could be just a smart addict then. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't do very well, <laughs> you know, and it and makes and then it'll make you miserable. Knowledge that's not applied mm -hmm. just makes us smarter, but it doesn't do anything for us. That's right. Applied knowledge is what we know as wisdom. Yes. It's when we get concepts, we begin to apply them in our lives, and then they begin to give us results. So the first step is education. Mm -hmm. The second step is application, and the third is to make sure you put yourself in a support network. Right. Well, and the thing is, is that when you're in recovery, you think that you're the only one going through this, these things that you're digging up, that you've done, that you've wish you would have done, things that you've lost. So when you're alone, you, you can become very hopeless. And that's not a good place because you were hopeless inside the addiction. So you don't want to be hopeless inside recovery. You want to start as you recover. You also want to have a support group that says, oh man, I went through that at the same time when I was, you know, two months sober or when I was five years sober or when I was 20 years sober, that you start to realize that this is just the process of uncovering my truth, yeah. which is, is a, it's a lifelong thing. I mean, you know, just people that aren't addicts have to continue to grow. I mean, we all have to grow. The unfortunate thing is that if you have this addiction, that is just another hurdle. However, if you do the work, you become a very real, deep person that becomes unafraid to love, really. Yeah. So the model we have that we use as a recovery model, and it's been very effective, it's been used by treatment centers, uh, inpatient treatment centers, it's been used by outpatient treatment centers, it's been used in our practice. The recovery model is taken from our book here. It's called uh, A Roadmap to the Soul. And it's a book that Holly Kim and I did together. It really comes out of her journey of breaking free from her addiction and me coming alongside of her, helping put language to that process. It's a very simple process, but it's very powerful. And we call that process the voices within. And how does that apply in terms of recovery for addiction? Well, for myself, being someone that sees in pictures, very simple person, that it was something that I was in the 12-step movement and works very well. I love the 12 steps. However, I needed something to make sense of what was going on because when I was using, when I would go to bed in the morning, but when I would go to bed, I knew what I was doing wasn't who I was and that they were two, it was two different people. You know, the good news was is that I wasn't multiple, but I, sometimes I felt multiple. But in this process, what I could see was there was a part of me that had control of me. And as we say in the 12 steps, I'm powerless over this thing and my life is unmanageable and that was not easy to see so there was a part of me that was managing my life and it was bringing me places and doing things I didn't want to do I didn't have the power that I needed to take my life back so in the process it was like understanding that there was a part of me that had control that was unhealthy and then there was a part of me that was very wounded and when I would remove the part of me that was sedating, all I could feel was pain, which would make me want to sedate again. So then as I started to separate that and see that there was a part of me that was pure raw emotion and it was a very, it was all pain. And then from there, there was the truth and who I really was and what my heart really was about and who, that I was a loving person, that I did care about people and that I did have a lot of guilt about what I had done. So when I started to understand that, that there was three different parts of me 
And I started to put that into a language and categorize that. So then when I had a thought, a feeling, a belief, a behavior, I would separate it on which part was what. So that way I could have better internal management because it was the internal that was unhappy. And I, they say it's an inside job. So if it's an inside job, I need to go inside and find out what is disorganized, what is dysfunctional, so I can become organized and functioning. And that, so that was the major part of building this concept so I could have some type of organization internally so I could be free because I was very controlled by my emotions. I was very controlled by my past. I was very controlled by what had I had done and, and the way that I had seen the world, the belief systems. I had grown out of that. So this was a process to allow me to see that what I was doing what I was doing was not who I was. How I was feeling was not who I was. However, I couldn't just throw that away. That had to be loved, cared for, and categorized. So when I had those thoughts, feelings, or beliefs, I could categorize them, listen to my thoughts, make decisions, and then go from there. Yeah, so basically, Holly Kim had the vision of dividing your inner life into three parts. Yes. There was the bucket, which was your true self of who you really are. Right. Which has the your purpose. It's the very best part of you. It's your conscience. Yes. It's the part of you that's connected with God in some way. Then the other bucket is what we call the protector. Exactly. And that bucket is your coping behaviors. Yes. That's the attic inside. Yes. That's the part of you that's your defense mechanisms. Yes. I did an exercise with a guy not long ago. I said, tell me what your true self says about cocaine. It's horrible. I spend my money. I'm out of control. It brings a lot of negative consequences. And I lose a lot of sleep. And I'm exhausted afterwards. What does your protector say about cocaine? Hmm. It's the most awesome thing right. in the world. Exactly. I love it. It right. keeps me going. It tells me it makes me more productive. So there's two adamantly different belief systems exactly. inside his own mind. And what we help you do is to start to separate who is saying what. So yes. you have this protector part, you yeah. have your true self, and then we have this third voice, which we call the wounded child. Right. And we call it the wounded child because a long time ago there was a guy named John Bradshaw, and he's wrote some awesome <laughs> books, and he used to do this thing called the inner child. However, the inner child was a mixture of your true self magical child and your wounded self. And for me, that was a, just a little too much mixture because I had a lot of wounds. So what I did was I just separated those two and put the magical, the good memory child with my true self and I separated the whole wounded self and made it one separate part. So in the wounded self, it's any painful emotion that I've had any time in my life and I put it in one bucket because when that thing hits it could be about something that happened yesterday or it could be about something that happened 50 years ago but it's in that bucket so what started to happen was what I realized was that there was me then there was a part of me that was very wounded and the minute that part of me spoke this part came out, which was my protector, because my protector wanted to protect the wound so then I would not feel pain. However, the way this part of me, my protector, wanted to handle the world and handle my emotions and handle life was very different than the way I needed to do that in a, as a human being and as an adult. That this part of me would pretend, would act like nothing happened, would sedate and, you know, do things that was hurting me. So I had to separate those two. It's kind of like having two kids. Yeah. Like one one is crying and one is screaming. That those two parts needed to be separated. And I needed to learn to speak to that, listen to that, and then from there make decisions, say no, thank you for sharing. And then from there go into what was I how was I going to handle this thing that was upsetting me internally. Yeah. So if you divide it up into those three voices, it makes it a lot easier to, number one, understand yes. and to begin to manage. You yes. know, I, I had a guy that was dealing with drinking and had gone through a bad divorce, 
and we started to just help him divide the buckets, the three different buckets. And the true self was saying, I'm in a lot of pain, but I'm working through it. I'm healing and I'm going to stay on path and not drink and sedate the pain so that I can get through it and resolve this issue. His protector was saying, this, this sucks, I'm hurting. A drink will be fine and take the edge off and it can help me connect with other people. And then the wounded part was, I'm devastated, I'm hurting, I feel lost. And so if you notice that the wounded part and the protector or the coping behavior work together as a team, so as Holly Kim said, we need to start dividing that up. Look, one of the most freeing things for anybody dealing with an addiction is when they begin to realize that they are not their addiction. Right. That that's not who they really are. When Holly Kim and I look at a person straight in the eye and we say, we know that it was never your intention to be on your second divorce and to have your kids scared of you and to be in financial bankruptcy and then being fired from three jobs. We know that that wasn't your vision and your dream when you got married and when you had visions for your children and your family. That's right. That that's not who you really are. That's a part of you that created it, but it's not who you really are. And when they see that we see that about them, they always begin to what? All right, weep. They always begin to weep. Yeah. And so it's so freeing to be able to separate the coping behavior from who you really are and the model, the recovery model that is so simple but has so many layers, yeah. it's not easy, it's simple, right. is a three-step model. And the first step is that I need to contain what we call the protective behavior or the addict behavior. So the recovery model or the recovery process has three stages. Stage one is to contain the addict behavior or what we call the protector. Right. We need to learn to stop that behavior and put it in a cage, in a sense. Right. But once you stop that behavior... Then what happens? Immediately, the wounded self comes out. Yes. So, it's like, I remember when I told myself, no more drugs, no more alcohol. I mean, I would cry for two years. Because I, I had two years of tears in me. I mean, you know, that I cried every day for two years. But... Is because I had so much pain in me, but I wouldn't allow myself to sedate on that level. So on that, when you contain the protector, what starts to happen is, is that the wound itself is going to come out because you don't have anything covering it anymore. So it starts to burst out because you got this one on hold. And remember, this has one job. Your protector has one job, and that's to stop this from hurting. So if I take this thing away, it's major thing that it uses to make this stop hurting, this comes out and the weeping and the pain starts to come out. Yeah, so that's stage two. Yes, but don't quit. Once you stop the protective behavior, the wounded child yes. or the emotional pain will start coming to the surface. Yes. And that's why we need to learn to deal with and to heal the wounded child part. Right. We need to help you manage your emotions in a more effective way. And so stage two is the healing. Right. Then Being kind to yourself during this time. Not like, oh my God, I have a feeling, slap myself. It's learning to be really kind. So a lot of people, when you talk about dealing with issues, what we're really talking about is learning to truly love myself in that moment. Quit being mean to myself because I'm hurting. Yeah. And there's a lot to say about that stage. But, yes. Uh, to heal the wounded child. Stage three is empowering yes. the true self. Once you begin to separate from your coping behaviors, your addictive behaviors, you start healing and letting go of the emotional pain and dealing with that, separating from it, then the true self of who you really are begins to emerge spontaneously. Yes. And so we need to coach that out we need to empower that. Mm -hmm. We need to encourage that part of you. And we have to make a roadway for you to be able to dream again, to be able mm -hmm. to go after what your destiny is. Yes. It's a very simple three-step process, but that's the recovery model that we use. Right. It has a lot of depth, like we said. It's very challenging in a lot of ways, but it's a way 
and it's a process to fully recover all the things that were lost yeah. when you're in your addiction. Yes. So we would encourage you to get the book, A Roadmap to the Soul, for three different reasons. It's going to help you in your education and understanding the inner life of someone that's suffering with an addiction. And it's going to help you separate and categorize and really see yourself or see the other person differently. So it does the education piece, but it also does the second part of our recovery processes, which is application. And so there's practical questions and answers uh, that you can give to these question exercises throughout the book that will really help you apply all the concepts that you have. You know, Holly Kim and I have always been proponents of, of making it simple. Yeah. Making it effective, making it simple. And I really know that you, once you start answering the questions, you start applying, putting some of those questions into action, some of the suggestions that we have, as you apply that, it's going to move you to a greater level of freedom that you haven't experienced if you're struggling with an addiction. The third thing that the book provides is that we have lots of case studies. Mm -hmm. And so lots of examples, practical examples of, oh, I identify with that, I identify with this, I mm -hmm. identify with those belief systems. And it helps spark your memory, gives you, gives you understanding, and will really help you categorize the three different parts of you and make a segue to freedom, huh? Yes. And, you know, we've been doing this work since the 90s. I've been sober since 83, so I've been working on this process since 1983. That this works. If you work it, it works. And it's not the only way, but it's the way that God gave us to do it. And we've had lots of people over the last 30 years that have used this process I mean, I actually had someone send me a message over Facebook the other day, and I saw her 30 years ago. Wow. And she just got 30 years sobriety, <laughs> and she was on her way to, she wanted me to know, and she sent us on Messenger, she sent some pictures of old uh, notes from the Voices Within before we even had the book, because we were <laughs> lecturing on and on a retreat, and she still had them. And she sent that to us, and she said she was on her way. 30 years ago? 30 years, yes. And she uh, was on her way to go pray. So, you know, when something works, you don't let it go. And that's why we wrote the book. We still do this process with our clients. Um, and it's really the way we live. So, you know, take it from us. It is our first baby. <laughs> and... Um, you know, we're very uh, blessed to have a process that we can share with others and help them through their journey. Yeah, and if you're interested in purchasing it, yes. we have links down in the description of this video. And we know that it will help you in your recovery process. And we want you to stay in touch. Let us know, yes. you know, what you think of it, how it's helped you, how you've applied it. We get emails, we get letters, we get things from many mm -hmm. people that have been touched by this process mm -hmm. and testimonials and we want to hear yours also yes. we also want to encourage you, if you find in value in this particular video like this video yes. uh, subscribe to our channel because you know this is our master class in terms of addiction and recovery but we put out all sorts of videos on a lot of different yeah. topics so please uh, do that and you know there's the general notion of addiction, but then there's the specific types of addiction. Yeah. So we did recently a specific video on what is alcoholism and that unique animal. Mm -hmm. We also did one on what is opiate addiction and how it's uniquely manifest itself. So if you have an interest in learning more about these specific addictions, go ahead and tap on the, the screen right now and it'll take you to that next video and Holly Kim and I will see you in the next video. Yes, we will. And there's lots of hope.